it'll come up and tell us. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for the afternoon, thankful for uh, time around your word, the things that have been shared with us in the previous hours. We're thankful now for the time around the table and the fellowship and the food. Uh, we ask as we look at your word this afternoon that we might appreciate okay, let's have a word of some Father, we're thankful for the afternoon. careful distinctions that we find in your word and that we might uh, appreciate them and we thank you for it. Amen. Okay. That was okay. That's just running in the background. So, okay. Today I have two pronouns up. Here. I think I'm, I kind of think I've done this study or something along this line before, but I had a conversation uh, Thursday night with somebody about one of these pronouns. Uh, and um, let's, let's go take a look at it. Let's go look at Second Corinthians. I'll just show you where this started. Second Corinthians chapter 13. Second Corinthians chapter 13. And uh, verse 5, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, and it's uh, 13, 5, that's all right, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, and it says, uh, test yourselves, if you are in the faith, prove, or, or test yourselves, if you are in the faith, prove yourselves, interestingly enough, uh, except you do not fully experience, you know that yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, uh, unless you're unapproved. Interesting enough, he uses two different words for proving or testing. The first one is test yourself, ex actually expecting failure. And I think part of that is, is, is Paul says, uh, don't, don't go into this giving yourself the benefit of the doubt. He says, I really don't want you guys to check yourself and to see if you're really practicing the faith right now, because he knows for a fact some of the problems going on, they're not. But then he says, and then prove yourselves. In other words, hopefully they, it would turn things around the other way. In both cases, the pronoun that he uses is the second one. So we have these two pronouns. The only, this one I didn't write out in English because I figured most of you probably could figure it out. But hap, al, tas, okay? And alelon. This is the pronoun that's used here. And what these two pronouns are telling us, this pronoun is, let's see, we have a, a group here like this. We'll just use two people. And they are doing activity between each other. That's the nature of all alone. Okay. Ha'autas is a pronoun where, well, we can take these two people. This person is doing it to themselves. And this person is doing it to themselves. He's proving himself. He's proving himself. Now, the reason I, I mentioned this is because I was talking to somebody the other night. And they, they mentioned this verse in, in passing. They're, they weren't arguing with me or anything, they just mentioned this, you know, as a comment, uh, as he and I were talking, that believers are supposed to prove themselves. And he says, uh, that's not a singular pronoun, it's a plural pronoun, which it is, he's right on that account, but he's talking to a group of people. And, the, and this particular pronoun, this one, this bottom one that he's using here, is telling us, that each one of you in the group does this to himself. And he thought that what you're supposed to, and I think it came up because he was kind of contradicting, now that I think of it, something I said, we're as Christians, we're not fruit inspectors. Because see, there's a lot of people that run to a verse in the book of Matthew in chapter seven that says, uh, you will know them by their fruits. And so then they look at it and go, well, I can tell believers, uh, uh, Dwight's a believer because I see his fruit. This person over here, I look at him, there's not somebody sitting there, uh, and that person, they're not a believer because I don't see the fruit, or the fruit doesn't look good. But that's not, but what they're doing is they're lifting a verse out of context. What Jesus is talking about is to be wary of false teachers. And he says, you'll know the teachers by their fruit. So if you have a teacher that's teaching you this, but their fruit does not agree with what they're teaching, Watch out. This is what Jesus was getting at with those people at that time. So it's not talking about you going around inspecting other believers all the time, trying to figure out who's a believer and who's not, because, well, that person showed fruit and that person doesn't show fruit. It's not what he's talking about. And I haven't mentioned just briefly, not in as much detail as I just gave you here, 
mentioned this in passing because of something that had been said. And then this person goes, well, he says, I disagree. He says, uh, Paul over here says you're supposed to test yourselves and that's a plural pronoun. So you're all supposed to be testing each other. And I was like, I was trying to, I didn't know what it was. I pulled my phone out of my pocket. I pull it up. I look at the Greek text on my phone. And I'm like, nope. I said, that's, so that pronoun, I said, is a reflexive pronoun, not a reciprocal pronoun. And so Paul is telling each one of those individuals, you test yourself, whether you're in the faith. And in reality, to some degree, unless a person is just out and out doing something wrong, unless they're just completely acting in sin, I have no ability to know whether they're in the faith or out of the faith, whether they're actually living the faith or not. That's something that they have to do because there are believers that go through the motions of being in the faith, but they're actually not living the faith. They're just doing the motions because they know that's what's expected of them. Well, then what this did was it, it and I told him, I said, I've been through these, pre I said, and he said, I can tell you, if you go home and you pull out a dictionary, a Greek dictionary, and you look this word up, they are going to say, and, and I didn't look at any of my dictionaries on my shelf because I know what they say because I've looked at them before. But I've looked at the, the dictionary on here, uh, which I have a paper copy of one of those in here. But they say these are the same. They say these, these really are, there's not really any difference between these two. Uh, they, what they start off with is they say this is reciprocal, and this, is this is reciprocal, this is reflexive. And then they say, but a lot of places, they're just the same. There's no difference. Uh, now, I'm going to say, I think that that's a growing trend within Christendom and even within real believers is, is to make less and less of distinctions and to actually say they're all the same. This is just a synonym for this. This is just a synonym for this. And, and, uh, and I disagree. So I, I went back and I, I was thinking through this again uh, afterwards. And I was thinking of oh, this. And Josh had asked me if I'd uh, share something. And I usually have something or else that I'm working on. But then I thought, you know, this, this might be just a, a good little Bible study to look at the distinction between these two words, these two pronouns. And to see where, it, where we can see clearly that they're different, but then also see that there's some places where I believe that there is, the distinction's different, but it's a very specific type of situation. And we'll point that out when we get there. But then put the point out before we're done, try to respect your time, uh, try to point out when, before we're done, why that's important. I think this passage right here is illustrative of why it's important. We as a church are not here going around inspecting each other, putting each other to the test. Yes. Just a quick question about a synonym. So even, are there that many synonyms in Greek? And even in the English language, a synonym doesn't necessarily mean an exact same definition. A lot of times it's a word that can be used the same way but there is still distinction between the words. Right. About the only time, from what I understand, about the only time we end up with something that is really close to a true synonym is if you have a word, maybe shall we say, that comes from French and then a word that comes from German. And they both come into English and we're using both of those and the French and the Germans were using these two words and they both are referring to the same thing and somehow or another, we, they both end up in English. And I'm not saying we have a French and German set of words that do that. But yeah, there are quite a few synonyms. In fact, I've got uh, Trench's synonym was, uh, was a guy back in the late 1700s, early 1800s, I believe. I, and I probably got the dates wrong. They did a whole bunch of work on synonyms. And so he'll have, and they'll have them grouped under, under groups. So sometimes the synonym, he may have four words that all seem like they're very, very much the same in Greek. And he goes through and he tries to show you the nuances of what they share in common and how are they different. Uh, W.E. Vine did this with the Vine's dictionary back in the early half of the 20th century. And yet a lot of people look at Vine and they poo-poo him like, yeah, that was so unscholarly. But Vine actually did a really good job. And some of the distinctions that Vine drew out, as I've 
gone and tested them. And that's what you have to do. You actually have to go through and you have to look at all the places where these words occur. In fact, there's a guy who was listening to his podcast where he's talking about Greek and Hebrew studies. He's a lot of, says a lot of times when people are looking at a word, he says, you'd be surprised at how many of them go look at five places where the word occurs. And he says, if a word occurs 500 times, he says, they oftentimes, they're not going to go through and look at all 500 occurrences of that word. And you know what? Looking at 500 occurrences of a word is helpful. Case in point, I don't mean to digress too much, but I God allowed me to have a day where I showed the same science film, the four biology classes at high school back I don't know, three or four years ago. They had the same film, all of them had to watch it. And then the other two classes I had that day, they also were watching a film and filling out a worksheet. I sat at the back of the classroom on my computer and I was looking at an Old Testament word that is translated iniquity in almost all your English Bibles. And I wanted to understand what this idea of twisted or perverseness was. And I would say after looking at, and I don't know if that was 500 times, it was a lot of occurrences in the Hebrew going through those. And almost, I would say, let's say 80%, just to be safe, 80% of the time, it clearly was talking about the sin nature. It clearly references what Paul identifies as works of the flesh. I came away from that going, it's not just a perverseness, it's the old the way the Old Testament believers referred to what we call a sin nature. They didn't have that word expression sin nature. And that kind of that's what Paul kind of says in the New Testament. Okay, so let's so anyway, are there true synonyms? There probably are some true, but most synonyms, there's some place where the overlap doesn't work. Okay, which is what you're asking. So let's go to Matthew 3. I've got 50 scriptures to get through real quick here. So Nobody heard that? Yeah. Oh, okay, somebody. We were all stunned to silence. <laughs> stunned to silence. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. <clears throat> and Jesus uh, is, or excuse me, um, John the Baptist is speaking. He's baptizing people and the Pharisees and Sadducees come out. And uh, verse 8, he tells them to do fruit worthy of repentance. In other words, demonstrate that they really have repented. And do not think, do not be of the opinion to say in yourselves, we have Abraham for a father. And he says, God is able, I say, God is able to even raise up children out of these stones to Abraham, if that's what God wants. That in yourselves, do not think to say in yourselves, that's that second prep pronoun. It's the house. In other words, it's these people in themselves going, well, Abraham's our father. We're good. So it's each person talking to himself. It's not talking in the group. It's an individual speaking uh, to himself uh, is what he's looking at. Let's turn to chapter nine in Matthew, Matthew chapter nine. In verse one, it says, and getting down into a boat, they, uh, they crossed over and they came even to their own city and looked. they brought to him a paralytic on a, that was being laid out on a stretcher, stretcher. And Jesus seeing their faith, that is the faith of the friends, he said to the paralytic, be confidently cheerful, child, uh, your sins are forgiven. We're all familiar with this, this account. And behold, some of the scribes said, in themselves, this one blasphemes. Notice what he says. And Jesus, seeing or knowing their, the thoughts, the things that are going on here, their enthusiasm, the things that are in their heart, as Paul would use this term over in Hebrews 4 uh, of them. Why are you thinking this, this evil in your hearts? See, it's in your hearts. See, these guys haven't opened up their mouth and go, he's blaspheming. No, Jesus is knowing what they're thinking. He knows what they're thinking. So these people are saying that in themselves, in themselves. They're not speaking in a group uh, at this place. And so Jesus responds to something that they are uh, speaking in that way. Um, turn to chapter 16. Matthew 16, verse 7. By the way, this pronoun, we are only looking at a few of these occurrences because this pronoun occurs 294 times in the New Testament. Uh, the second, the top pronoun on the top, alalas, 
or Ale Lom, uh, 94 times, not nearly as much. Probably because something you do to yourself is a lot more common that you're saying or talking to yourself than that you're talking out in a group. Uh, but anyway, uh, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 7. <clears throat> Uh, verse, five, verse 5 says, and his disciples, they came to the other side, and they forgot to take bread. And Jesus said to them, look, that you that you pay attention, and my inner layer says beware, but literally that you pay attention, from the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then they were, notice this, they're logically reasoning in themselves, saying, we, we didn't take bread? <laughs> See, the, the disciples are going, we, we, we didn't take bread, so why are we we're being worried about leaven? See, so it's it, they're not like in a group going, what, what does he mean? We didn't bring any bread. No, these guys are saying it to themselves. It's in themselves that they're speaking these things. They're not speaking them uh, in a group, uh, although that might be the way that we would be inclined to think that they are going. Yeah, they translate to one another. Yeah, discuss this among them. Right, yeah, that's, and and that's in that this is one of the passages where that's the way where they understand they think these guys are talking among themselves, but I think that that's significant. It's just like with the guy, the last group of guys that Jesus know he knows what they're thinking in their hearts and he responds to what they're thinking, not what's coming out their mouth. It's the same thing with the disciples here. Now, is there a possibility that maybe that there was something verbal they said? Yes, but the emphasis that Matthew gives it here is that it was something that they are reasoning. Wait a second, we didn't bring bread. What, what's he talking about leaven for? Okay. And uh, so they, so our, anyway, so our English Bibles, because our translators, they make the judgment call that he's talking about a group talking among themselves. They translate it that way. This is never used in second person. It's never used in second person. You're saying, I think that there are some places where it's used in this. No, uh, no. What? That it can be first or second. Yeah, it's, well, second person would be you guys. And there are some places where Jesus is saying you guys in yourselves in that way. Because there is a, this is heautas, but there's also seautas. Seautas has a sigma out in front and that's you. This is, this is autos, take that epsilon off the front, autos, autu, this is, is what we're seeing here. That's he, she, or it. That's third person singular. Set autos, you put a sigma out front, you're talking about you. So you're, so you're addressing a, a you uh, in that way. <clears throat> but that usually is classified as a distinct, as a distinct term uh, in, in a lot of places. Okay, so. I'm trying to get my, my bearings in here. So Mark, well, let's go to the book of Mark. And let's go to Mark 1. I think Mark 1 is the one I want to start with. I had it written in the... Nope, it's not Mark 1.21. I think that must have been Matthew. Or, um, let me just go back and see if that was Matthew 1. I put it with the Mark verses, but I'm thinking it doesn't look right. So just let me grab this real quick. Test my, check myself. Nope. No, it was supposed to be 121, and it's not in either one of those places. I I messed it up. That's okay. So anyway. I'm just wondering if it was where Joseph was thinking, planned to send her away secretly. In Matthew 119? Yes, Matthew let me take a click. I didn't really No, there's not a how toss. There's not either one of those pronouns in there. But I had 121 and I don't know where that one was supposed to go. <laughs> it's just it's sticking out here with the Matthew verses. Okay, so we're going to Mark. We're going to Mark Mark chapter 9. So this Mark 9 um I would say interpretively, this is a little bit of a challenging statement. Well, Mark 1, 27, isn't it? And they were all amazed that they questioned themselves saying, what is this? Maybe I wrote. Oh, okay. 
Let's go back to Mark 127. So I wrote 121 and it's 120, it's supposed to be a seven there. And I wrote it down as a one. <clears throat> Um, let's go back up to verse 21 so you can see uh, and they entered into Capernaum and immediately then in the Sabbath then uh, entering into the synagogue he was teaching and they were all amazed by his teaching for his teaching them as one having authority and not like the scribes and immediately there was in the synagogue then a man with an unclean spirit spirit and he cried out saying what is this uh, what is this to us and to you, Jesus of the Nazarene, in other words, what's this between the two of us, we might say in modern English, have you come to destroy us? I know you, you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent, be muzzled, be quiet, come out of him and convulsed him then, the, the unclean spirit, and crying out with a loud voice, he came out of him. And every then, everyone was then amazed so that they were debating with themselves saying, what is this new teaching with authority? Now, this is us. But this, yours doesn't say it's Ha'atas? Oh, it's actually it's Ha'atas. I don't know why they, why they, your shows it as autos. It, it, it is autos, but this is this is this is the situation we have, and this is the this is the exception to the rule. Okay, the rule is that this is reflexive. The only time it's not reflexive, strictly speaking, is when it has the preposition pros out in front. So it's preceded. So it's facing one another, facing themselves. And it's pros, and when you have pros, time to get new markers here. These are really dying on us. And this would be pros like this, okay? When this when this occurs with pros, I agree. I think it is looking, it is looking in that those situations at something that maybe takes place here. I would say this: the, Why is he not using alelas? Why is he using this pronoun in these settings? And we have, I'm going to say, let's say a dozen of these, or maybe a few more, maybe twenty that I came across with pros. My suggestion on the reason the process is it's now it's like, it's like I turn to Dwight, and it's like I don't want to, I don't want this to go everywhere. So I'm going to kind of keep it closed in here like this. So it's still using Ha'otas kind of with this tight closeness here, but it's closeness now in here facing like this, and we're keeping it close. Alelas, while it's within a group, the Ha'otas is really bringing that group down tight and close as you're using it. And the process I'm facing, not facing myself. So it doesn't say I'm doing this in myself. He's doing it process word process we get the word pros upon face from it you're facing something this is the word that's used in john 1 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was pros facing god and the word was god and in the same uh, and john uses the same expression over in first john 1 about the life that was facing god and so you have this idea of two facing each other in this way so this is this actually is i'm, I'm glad you caught this because this is important because this is one of the key passages then of showing where there is an exception, but it's only when it occurs with the preposition pros. I haven't found any exceptions of this being anything other than reflexive, except when it occurs with the preposition pros. And that happens in languages. That languages, you have something that's generally a rule, but you put it in a particular kind of construction and that rule is bent. Okay, and and we do that in English. We have uh, we have things in English. We all know that's like that that what we say is not proper English, but we've got come accustomed to saying a thing in that way. And when you say it in that way, we all know that that has become accepted usage, even though it seems to deviate from traditional rules that we have. And that's the case. And I have several others like that. We'll grab. Um, We'll grab one more. Let's go to chapter 10. I was going to have you go to verse 9. But let's go to verse 9. I want you to go to the verse 9 one. No, go to 10. 
Go to 10. I'm sorry. <laughs> 10. 10. Mark 10. 10. Mark 10, verse 26. <clears throat> Now, this is the setting where um, there has been a rich man that has approached Jesus uh, and uh, wants to know what to do that he might inherit eternal life. And um, when Jesus gets down here, let's see. Um, first, let's go to verse. The man goes away sorrowful, if you remember. He goes away, verse 22, sorrowful because he has many possessions. And that word possessions is is a word for property. He has a lot of properties, okay? And Jesus then looking about says to his disciples, how difficult or how with difficulty are those having possessions or things to enter into the kingdom of God? Now, keep in mind, he's not talking about just particularly how to get saved. He's talking about what they put their, their confidence in while they were living this life and how it affected their coming to follow Jesus so that they could be guaranteed they would enter that kingdom when that kingdom began. That's what he's getting at. Verse 24, and his disciples were amazed at his words. And Jesus again then replied and said to them, children, how difficult it is, is it to enter into the kingdom of God? Now he just says, anybody really, how difficult it is to enter into the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. He does kind of take it back to the rich person, but he's indicating it's difficult. Now, if you don't have much to leave behind, that might have seemed easier. But you know what? Even the guy that doesn't have a lot has a tough time giving up what he has. You ever seen any of those pictures of hoarder houses and sometimes those hoarder houses are not rich people and they don't have a big house and they don't have a lot of stuff but they have a lot of stuff because every little thing they have is important they can't throw out a single newspaper they can't throw out a single magazine they can and everything piles up and they can't get rid of this stuff it's like whether you're rich or poor your life is defined by your stuff then he says verse 26 and they, or the disciples then, were even more amazed, saying, facing themselves now, to themselves. Who is able to be saved? Now, he doesn't indicate. Mark doesn't tell us that the disciples are each one of them saying it to himself. It's that the disciples here within the group are looking around going, well, who can be saved then? Who can be saved? I mean, if the rich man can't be saved, who can be saved? But they're saying it. When they're, but it's not, they're not speaking this to everybody. They're not going to proclaim this to the crowds that are around going, oh, good grief, Jesus is crazy. Who can be saved? And like within their tight little group here, they're going, who can be saved? This is what sometimes people are thinking they're saying in some of those others where it's in themselves. But those are, I think, people doing this. This is really tight in here, which is what the preposition pros uh, is, is adding uh, to this matter. Let's go to, um, I'm, I am still going to skip that one. We're going to go to Romans 1. I had one in there, but it's just, I, I think I'll get distracted with the background of it. So Romans 1, verse 27. Romans 1, 27. And he's talking about, uh, um, Jim was going over this in his class this morning about God giving these people over. And he says in verse 27, likewise, they're males. And he does use the word for a male here, not a female. Likewise, they're males leaving the natural use of the female. There we have the word female burned in their craving or their stretching out of themselves unto, here's a one another, an alelas. Okay. Uh, to one another. So obviously, I'm not burning for myself. This is, these are men that are burning for other men. I think we understand that uh, in this context. And so this is a, a really good example of the alilas, but then keep going. Uh, burning one another, then uh, performing or rendering out then the things that are shameful and the, the payback, my Bible says retribution, but the payback that is there, that is due to their heir, they take away in themselves. 
see that? They take away in themselves. In other words, it's, it starts off with this relationship be, between men, but the problem is it's not, it's not in the end what the group, it's what each individual carries away in himself. In other words, there is damage that is done to him by the activity that he's engaged in, which by the way, tells you going back in history, there have been physical consequences throughout history for this kind of activity. Okay. Right. Now understand what he's saying there. And he says, and so he uses the, the reflexive pronoun in the last part of it, but it starts off in a group, turns out it's what ends up happening to the individual. Okay. Everybody, everybody follows. Okay. It's a good play. Turn to 12, Romans 12, verse 16. Romans 12, verse 16. Romans 12, 16, it says, uh, having the same frame of mind or framing your mind with the same thing towards one another. So you got a group and it's towards one another that you, same thing, not the high things frame your mind with. High thing is apparently different than saying set your mind on things above, <laughs> but not the high things. Now, if you wonder what he means, the high things, he goes, but the humble things, um, and leading yourself in this way, and do not then become any, that word for framing your mind that were just, that was used in frame your mind with the same thing and not framing your mind with the high things. He uses a form of that to describe us. Do not become those that frame their minds from or alongside themselves. Now, what does that mean? It means that you look at yourself as all part of the body of Christ. That's the one another. That's the first part of the verse, the pronoun. But the last part of the verse, it's me. I am not the standard by which I think of everybody else. And isn't that exactly one of the things that causes disunity in humanity in general, but in churches in particular, since he's talking about a church? Yeah. The minute I start gauging everybody else, by the way, I do it. And I set my frame of mind by me. That's when we run into problems, right? Right? Yeah, because now I'm going to say, well, you're not doing it the way I do it. And the way I do it is right. Therefore, you're wrong. And, and I've got the right standard. And you've got the wrong standard. And that's what he says. The first part of it is you frame your mind with these things. And in the context, if you were to go to the beginning of the chapter and read down through it, the context has been about function as part of the body. It's having that same attitude that you're all part of the body and not a single one of us is above being a servant to others. That's the right attitude. Okay. So this is a nice verse because again, we have both of the pronouns in the same verse. Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two. See, I always like the verses where you have both pronouns together because they are helpful sometimes in showing you that there are two different ideas being used. Philippians chapter two, this is very similar to the last one that we just looked at over there in Romans. It says, do nothing from selfish ambition, neither according to empty glory, but in humility, leading one another as being above yourselves. We've got both pronouns there. Esteeming one another, literally you're leading your mind to consider one another above yourselves. Obviously, they can't be referring to the same thing. It's I, each one of us, he'autas, considers the group, one another, as we have to lead our minds better than ourselves. That's the second one. Does everybody see that? So in, in the Greek, it says, uh, in, but in humility, esteeming one another, that's the alelos, as above themselves. I said yourselves, but above themselves. And that would be the, the, the reflexive pronoun, the haotas. And we get that. I think we understand that's a good place to illustrate. There's a difference between the way you look at the group and the way you treat the group as better than you, which is what he's saying. And then verse, then he goes on to verse four, not 
uh, each person looking at their own things, but each one at the others. Now he's not saying I'm inspecting your stuff because I want it. He's saying what he's talking about is each one of you should be looking out for each one of you looking out for other people's things. He doesn't use the ale loss here. He uses heteros, somebody different than you. Look for that other, look out for that different person, not yourself. You're not just looking, which I think is why he uses heteros here because he's saying, look out for that other guy. Don't look out for yourself. Look out for that other guy. It's a hard lesson for us to, as Christians to learn, to actually really learn to put other people ahead of us and really look out for them before we look out for ourselves. Um, let's see. Trying to think which other one I want to grab here real quick. Okay, we've been on here for a long time. So let's, let's I'm just going to, I'm going to skip. I, I could give you more illustrations, but we're going to move. This is why this is important. And I think all of these should illustrate it, but go back to Ephesians chapter four. This is one of, this is one of the key verses. There's a parallel for this in Colossians chapter three. We've got two passages in here that I think are very, very important for grasping these distinctions. And we've emphasized these. You, if you've been in any of our studies for any length of time, if you've missed this, it's only because you weren't listening. <laughs> or maybe you were gone that day. But it says, become to one another. There's our alelas. Kind ones, tender-hearted ones. The, oh, verse 32. I'm sorry. 432. I apologize. 432. Become to one another kind ones and tender-hearted ones, or compassionate. Our Bible say tender-hearted. Literally, it's good, good gut, good bowels. The idea you feel it down here. Compassionate is what I mean. Be kind to one another. Be compassionate. Which again, I think this. I was talking to Ben Orth upstairs, uh, and um, I think Jim and I've discussed this before too. But Paul, when he writes Second Corinthians, one of the things that Paul says about himself is. That the, that the false apostles said about Paul, he's a wimp. He writes tough letters, but boy, when he's, in, when he's with you guys, he is such a wimp. Implying, we're not like that. We're tough. The false apostles are indicating that. Paul actually ends the letter and he goes, you know what? I'll show up and I'll show you power. If that's what you guys want to show up. You guys just keep being naughty and I'll show up and I'll show you power. But you know what I'd rather have you do? I'd rather have you get your act together and I would be weak. He actually uses that. I would rather be weak. And it gives you the impression when you read about Paul, that even though Paul was a guy that could go to toe to toe with philosophers on Mars Hill, he actually, you wouldn't have reached the position he had within the Sanhedrin if he couldn't actually articulate well and stand up and speak and to hold an audience's attention late into the night, like he did when he was up there in, I can't remember the town up there and Eutychus, you know, falls asleep and falls out. For Paul to do these kind of things or for Paul to stand in the synagogues and speak in the synagogues for like in Ephesus for three months, he's in the synagogue and they let him in there every day in the synagogue talking. Can you imagine that they tolerated this? If you got a guy that's tripping over his tongue and can't speak with some clarity, but you know what? In all of that, Paul was gentle. Paul was not bombastic. He was not a guy that ran roughshod over people. That has been one of the things I've tried to learn some things about in terms of the way I teach because I can be kind of, and one of the people that I really, really admired as a teacher could sometimes be very bombastic. And uh, I just honestly have to say, Obviously, according to Paul, there is a time and place for that, but I think it's very rare. <laughs> I'm not saying being angry because man's anger doesn't produce God's wrath. There's a difference between being forceful and really holding someone's attention and, and really trying to emphasize something versus being kind and gentle. And with that, Paul says, you know what we ought to be? And this is right on the tail of saying in verse 31, let all bitterness and anger and hostile anger and clamor. What's clamor? It's shouting. It's all of us shouting over the top of one another and, and blasphemy or slander. Let all that be put away from you with all evil. Just think of how often we as Christians, those are the kind of things that characterize us. 
Paul says, let that all be put away from you and become kind people and compassionate people to one another. So he's talking about as you deal with believers, as you deal with believers, you got to be kind, you got to be compassionate. Second of all, now here's the, here's the kicker, being gracious with yourselves. He switches to the heautas. And I'm convinced, he doesn't say this precisely, but I'm convinced the reason he says that is the number one reason that we are hard on others is that we are hard on ourselves. If we have the bar up here so high that we fail again and again and again, what do we do to others? We hold the bar up there for them too. And if we can't exercise and demonstrate grace to ourselves, how are we ever going to show kindness and compassion to others? It doesn't happen because it starts with you remembering who you are by God's grace at the Father's right hand in Christ. And when you begin to settle down there and sit and rest in that position, then you can start showing that kindness and compassion with others. The fruit from the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. I missed something in there. It's just come up with nine or I didn't do it right. <laughs> what? Oh, long-suffering. I skipped long-suffering because I jumped to kindness in there. <laughs> But those, but those are the qualities of fruit from the Spirit. And that's a person that's following the Spirit's lead to our life in Christ Jesus, see? So he's following the Spirit's lead to life in Christ Jesus, and the Spirit, and the Spirit produces this kind of qualities out of that person. He doesn't produce people that are, that are loud and in your face and shouting and hot and angry and veins popping out of their neck. That's not what this, that's not Spirit-produced character. Of course, I saw... I saw an image that a guy put online, a guy that I listened to once in a while, he put it online for his thing of Jesus overturning the tables up there. Now, Jesus probably was a little bit feisty when he overturned the tables, but Jesus is the, is the God man and he didn't have a sin nature. And so when he showed anger, it was pure righteous anger. It wasn't tainted by any sin nature problems like you and I have. But apparently the person that painted the, pa the painting this guy put up there must not have wanted to be Jesus too angry because he's overturning tables like this. He's kind of like this. He's just got this real passive look on his face. And the guy teaching goes, he thought that was really interesting. But he was, but he was kind of dealing with that a little bit. And that, interestingly, there's been some questions that that guy's had people toss out to him since about this whole thing of righteous indignation and such. And he kind of comes down a little bit where I do uh, on this. That's been a learning curve for me because I was raised righteous indignation. We need more of that. Five, chapter five, Ephesians five. One last section and we'll let you go. Ephesians chapter five, verse 18 tells us to be filled by the spirit. And then it says, speaking to yourselves and almost all your modern translations say speaking to one another, but it's to yourself in Psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. And you know why I think people want it to be one another? Because that's what, that's what our nature is, right? This is all about the filling is all about the fullness and the fullness is about the body of Christ from the end of chapter one. The filling is about you being able to function like you're part of the body. And you know, the problem is put it in context of what James has to say in James three, we run off at the mouth and we give each other, we, we, and a lot of times we think we need to tell people what, what we think. And that's the last thing in the world that we need to tell them. It's the last thing in the world because we'll run off and our sin nature will vent. I, my wife has to deal with a guy that sometimes, not particularly at her, but at her because of stuff out in the world or stuff like that, right? And so she's had to listen to me vent. I listen to her vent once in a while, but she has to listen to me more so. And I don't think it does her any good to listen to me fume about ridiculous unrighteousness that you see out in the world and fume over that. But see, we always think we want to speak. And he says, you know, the first thing you actually need, the spirit actually producing is not going and talking to everybody else. It's talking to yourself. It's talking to yourself. Parallel passage over in Colossians chapter three, verse 16, likewise says, speaking and admonishing yourself or teaching and admonishing yourself. And it's again, 
And everybody goes, well, how do you teach your manish yourself? You need to teach your manish yourself? No, you need to teach your manish yourself, first of all, because if you don't teach your manish yourself, you will fly off at the mouth and you will tell somebody else something and you can't ever take it back and it won't benefit them and it won't benefit you. And then he goes on here. So speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your hearts to the Lord. I was like this. So first it's to yourself, then it's to the Lord. And then you're giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord, uh, Jesus Christ to God, the father. So then you're speaking to God, the father, and you only get to one another when you get to verse 21. And it doesn't let you say a thing to him. It tells you to submit to him. <laughs> That's not what I want to do. I want to tell him something. Paul says, submit submitting to one another which to me is really interesting well because if you've got a conflict within the body of christ the last thing in the world you want to do is submit to that other guy that you got a problem with because he's different than you in some way you don't want to submit to what he has to say or what he's going to try to 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 do he maybe he's going to exercise and encourage you in life i don't want his encouragement he's going to try and teach you i don't want him to teach you i'm suffering he's going to show you mercy i don't want his mercy yeah, that happens. That happens in churches that people don't want to submit. I remember going, remember Dan and I together going to make a visit on an individual that was sick. And we went there and others were like, hey, hey how you doing? But the person that was sick, and I'm confident that that person was sick out of chastening. In fact, I don't know very, I know very few people that didn't feel that way in that set, set, setting, but that person, even when we were there, person was sitting in a hospital bed, not kidding you, was like this while we talked talk to them, just looking straight ahead. We're off the side. It's like, just wouldn't even acknowledge that we were there. It was so, so mad about the situation that had happened and the way things had happened in that setting. And, uh, yeah. And so sometimes here, we, we, we didn't go there. We didn't go to correct the person. We went to, to, to share some scripture, to cheer the person a little bit in the midst of their suffering. And uh, that person didn't want to hear us at all. Didn't want to hear us at all um, when we're standing there. And I, I think about that, that, yeah, you submit to one another. That's an important place. Like I said, there are parallels uh, in Colossians 3.13 and 16 to these two statements here in Ephesians 4.32 and Ephesians 5. Uh, they're parallels, basically saying the same thing. So all of that, hopefully, not, a, not just a little very quick word study through a word that occurs a lot, but hopefully giving you some examples of the fact that there is a distinction in these two terms. There is a situation in which this term kind of overlaps, and I'm just going to say kind of overlaps into this. It's not fully overlaps because it's not fully this idea up here kind of overlaps, but it's only when it, when it occurs with that pronoun or that preposition, excuse me, most of the time it's going to be in yourself, alelos in the group. We didn't look at a lot of alelos, but we saw some of them in verses where they're distinct from the haoptas. And then hopefully tried to show you actually from several of them, why that distinction is important and why if you miss it, and you just treat them all like they're the same, you're going to miss something very important that Paul is encouraging us with. So, any comments or questions at the end? You all managed to stay awake after eating a good lunch. Does the King James tend to translate it more speaking to yourself? I believe it does, but I don't. I don't think I have, I don't know if I have the King James on my iPad to check myself with, so. Just, it'd be kind of an interesting thing that James talks about maturity being related to how we use our mouths in our communication with each other and the mark of a mature one through understanding these pronouns, a mark of a mature one who is one who has spent a lot of time talking to himself before he talks to somebody else. You talk to yourself and you can work things out, you know, and be able to relate to somebody else in a gracious manner when you might not have initially been going that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not that I'm advocating senility, but you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> If there, I, 
there's an interesting, I'm just going to share an interesting situation. And I don't know if any of you, the rest of you have ever, this ever happened to you. Have you ever had to work all by yourself on something that doesn't take a lot of mental activity? So you're physically busy, but your mind has a lot of free time. Example, mowing the lawn. Washing. Mowing the lawn. Washing the lawn. I have... I, I remember um, years ago when we first lived here in Royal City, I probably mowed the lawn about 90% of the time for several years we were here. And I remember almost every time that I, what? Almost every time that I would mow the lawn, by the time I got done, I would be fuming. I would be fuming because I my mind would run and I would just start thinking about, this thing and this thing. And there were things at church that I was frustrated with. And I was like, how do I get this to happen here? And I would just be all so uh, worked up and all this. I realized one day, this is really ridiculous. I need to set my mind on better things. So what I started doing was I started preaching to myself. Remember Paul says that in Colossians 3. Of course, that's a product of being spirit filled, but it says teaching and admonishing yourself. So I would have something from scripture and I would start teaching like I was preaching a message to myself, and I would do it in my head while I was mowing the lawn. And those were long messages, because sometimes it'd take me an hour and a half to mow the lawn, and I, would, and, I wasn't, and I wasn't done. I haven't got to an altar call yet. <laughs> what? <laughs> Maybe I should have, yeah. But I would do that, and I found out, boy, it really, what Jim's saying, it really changed the way I was. I could go inside and I could take a shower afterwards and I was calm versus being just, mm, just really fed up and disgusted with some situation. And uh, uh, it's good to be busy and at work, but sometimes that's when you learn to mentally occupy your mind with something good. Um, um, oh, under... Everybody's going to hear it now under the bumper. It should be an under the bumper in the back. You guys can't figure out what's going on there. I'm going to have to make sure I edit that out. Otherwise, someone's going to come rip that thing off. No, anyway. But you actually think to me, not, not what she just said. Yeah. What you were saying actually makes me think. Um, it's not even the lawn, but when I was um, when I was in college, we took. Whitworth does, their, um, they call them core classes, and it's how they get around being a liberal arts, so they can be a liberal arts college, so they had sociology, but it's all biblical based. And so you do look at philosophy, and you do look at philosophers and different people throughout time who, you know, but anyway, we read this one guy, and I don't remember his name, he was, I think he was, a Puritan or but in that kind of time period and he set out to be in prayer 24 like if he was awake he wanted to be in prayer and there's been several times over the years where I thought you know I've thought about that like how would you do that but kind of what you're saying right there is that same kind of thing it's just training your mind to not be focused on worldly things not be focused on conversations that you're having, not be focused on, you know, but um, just kind of training your mind to be in communication with God at all times. I don't know, just made me think of it all is just a matter of <laughs> yeah. kind of just like we're supposed to rein in the whole sin nature, it's kind of just reining in and training our minds to be in a certain place instead of in the negative. I, and can I, can I, can I show an, il, a to, an illustration? This, Carmen's saying this, it, it brings up something that I, 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 wanted, I wanted to use sometime, but I'll probably forget it. Um, and if, you, if you're offended by my illustration, I apologize for, offending, for saying this. But this last week, I rewatched Rogue One. If you don't know which Rogue One was, it's the best Star Wars movie they made. <laughs> it's the one about how they go and steal the plans for the Death Star. So it's kind of the prelude to the original movie. And I really think it's really cool. But there's a guy that's not really a Jedi, but sort of a Jedi in there. 
and he's blind and he's always going, I'm one with the force and the forces in me. I'm one with the force and the forces in me. I'm one with the force and the forces. And he just repeats this again and again and again and again and again. And you're just like, and I was telling Peg when I was watching that and he's doing this area, it's going, that's kind of Eastern mysticism, which is what George Lucas kind of was doing with the whole force thing. But with that, that it's a mantra where you just repeat a thing. Because really the whole idea of a mantra is you're so full, you, you say this thing so to the point that you don't even have to really think about it anymore and you're just saying it and you're totally oblivious to everything else going on around you. That's the whole idea of that mantra is to be able to leave yourself because this is suffering. If I can move out of myself, I'm out of suffering. That's the way the Easterns looked at it. And we were talking about this on the way to Bible study and I, and I said, and that's what, that's what people think when we talk about framing your mind with things above, they think that that's what is, and it's not that way. It's not that way. Because guess what? God wants me to be aware of what's going on around me. He wants me to know if my wife has a need, if Dwight has a need, if Ronnie or Jim has, and so on and so forth. He wants me to pay attention to that. He wants me to be engaged down here. There are elements right there. Well, I was just going to say, so you're framing your mind. It's, it's a framework through which you're thinking and taking these stuff in. It's not just... It's not just to think I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. It's not just repeating a thing over and over and over ad infinitum. And for the, let me put you the well, line. I think Sorry. that's what fascinated me about this guy the way he said it was it wasn't that he was like repeating verses. It wasn't that it was just he wanted to be in that frame of mind right. where he was in constant communication with God. And I thought, what a what a goal. <laughs> and, and of all the things I learned of <laughs> Seriously, that was like, I mean, to, to be at a point where, you know, I mean, because you, it's not a mantra, because if you're just communicating, just like we're communicating right now, we can change the subject, we can, you know, so you're still getting input from the world. It's just that you're filtering it through your conversation with God, mm-hmm. was the way he presented it. You know, it was wasn't that you know he was trying to escape the world or because we read those we you know read about nuns who locked themselves up literally walled themselves in there was a window that they got food put through and shut themselves off of the world so that they could commune with god you know he, he that wasn't what his communion with god was his communion with god is i'm going to walk through this world and i'm going to live in this world but while I'm doing that, I want to have constant vertical. <laughs> I'm living here, but I want to have constant vertical communication. Oh, what a, a live. Anybody else? You were going to say something then. Yeah, just, I, I stated publicly many times that in teaching things against modern psychology. But it's interesting if you really have studied psychology at all. I could do it voluntarily. I had to for mission school. But there's actually a lot of modern psychology parallels very closely what scripture teaches about positive thinking, how positive thinking, positive self talk. The problem with psychology is it does all those things um, independent from God. And so I mean, thinking about our position in Christ is positive thinking. There's nothing that's not positive about that. Speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, that's positive self-talk, but it's all in relationship to my position, what God has done for me, what God's provision is. It's all in harmony with what God does, and psychology teaches you to do it independent of God, which is why it's part of satanic deception. But they're very, very close to the same, but Mm -hmm. far enough apart that it makes you miss the mark completely, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 Okay, let's have a word of prayer then. Father, we are thankful for your provisions for us uh, to be a part of the body of Christ so that we have others with which we interact. And there are benefits there, but there are also things that we have to address to ourselves so that we can be in the right frame of mind, the right attitude uh, for functioning with one another. Thankful for distinctions in your word. And help us as we look at those to pay attention to where those distinctions become blurred legitimately and where they are legitimately distinct and uh, to be able to appreciate those. 
Thank you for this time together and for the attention of these saints and for the fellowship to follow. Amen. See this? Okay. End it right there.